Okay, uh, let me grab the agenda again for anybody in the chat who hasn't seen it yet. Um, this is the second post London breakout call, I think number 13. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. Um, I appreciate people taking time to help us, you know, share your feedback and any issues that you've had. Uh, like I said, we don't have a ton on the agenda, so there's going to be a lot of open space for discussion or us to just uh, look at each other's faces, maybe. So the first thing, um, Jake, if you want to kick us off, that's fine, or we can start with something else, but uh, it'd be really cool. Um, something I've been looking forward to is seeing a little bit inside of how the other wallets have been handling 1559. I know we've got a couple other teams here um, and I'd love to hear from them as well if they'd like to say anything. But Jake, if you wanna start, um, give us your general thoughts or if you have a presentation prepared. Yeah, no presentation, but have some some thoughts for sure. Um, so I can, I can talk about kind of the, the UX of how, um, at least how MetaMask has implemented 1559, how it's been received. Um, I think like overall, I think it's going well, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of noise on like Twitter and public places. We like, we definitely learned we shook up people's workflows who use advanced settings. Um, so there, there was the thought of it's advanced settings. We should represent how the actual fields are in the UI. So like give them max priority fee, give them max fee. <clears throat> Don't try to sugarcoat it for advanced users. Um, and I, uh, we definitely have learned that people who are, are drifting towards advanced fields are not always people who like truly understand how 1559 works. Um, you know, people are saying, switch back to the old controls. We don't like these new controls. These are dumb. And it's like, you know, so, so they're, they're even advanced type users, I guess, are not as up to date as we had hoped or assumed. Um, but what we are learning is that that vocal group of people seems to be a very small group of people. Um, uh, so we, we, we've been tracking some analytics and our analytics are rough because we don't track a ton of things and details and, um, for privacy reasons. But, uh, one, one recent stat that was interesting is, um, and Kevin is on the call, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was 20% of people have only attempted to edit, to click the edit button of a transaction in the past seven days. So that means only 20% are even getting to the point in our UI where they could be exposed to the advanced UI. And that doesn't even mean they actually edit it or that they found it confusing or that they said something uh, bad about it or good about it. Um, so it is a small number of users that are getting into there, but we definitely need to uh, support that or like support that use case a little bit better. So that's one thing we're really focusing on is like, how do we improve this advanced edit experience? Um, advanced being, you know, going off the rails of an estimate, like not using a, a default value. Um, so another thing that we've learned as well is, so on the flip side, only 20% or, you know, 80% of people have not clicked edit in the past seven days. That could also be dangerous because we're seeing really big price spikes, right? Like, so there's kind of consistent price spikes with NFT drops or whatever it may be. And in those cases, we actually, you know, we want people to at least be aware that they they potentially could pay less and they don't have to pay market value if they're willing to wait for their transaction to go through. And going into 1559, there, I think there was also an assumption that, um, you know, let's focus less on editing. Um, there maybe there's less value in waiting um, and paying a lower price since we, you know, we have better estimates. We can just kind of give you the estimate. You'll go, you go through with it. The transaction will go through soon and that's great. Uh, with these price spikes, I think, um, we need to support like a, a, the use case of like, I'll wait, like I'll set my transaction, I'll queue it up and I'll wait for the base fee to come, come down dramatically in the case of a price spike. Also on the flip side, um, for people trying to get into NFT drops and stuff, they use the advanced controls, even though I don't think they fully understood within MetaMask, like what, I mean, they were only editing one field before there was the, the, um, the gas price, right? So it was much easier to edit. Now there's a couple of fields. Um, and you know, I've sat in a couple of discords with like NFT drops and stuff. And people were talking about like, what do I change my gas settings? And they're discussing it. And um, now that we don't, now that we don't have um, like, so our basic estimate right now, our low, medium, high, there's not a huge variation between them. They're, they're all kind of in the same range. 
So we, we need to be, I think, have much lower options and much higher options, um, much higher options for those when there is a price spike and there might be a gas war coming, um, allowing people to e easier, you know, to access that type of setting easier. Um, trying to think, I think those were the high points of what we have learned. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to talk more about it um, or more details or answer any questions. Uh, we are going, so we are looking at, the, the, I mean, we we launched with a, um, you know, with a V1, we had improvements in mind. Uh, so some of these learnings have shifted that. We're, we're gonna be rolling out a new uh, UI after another round of user testing. So I think we'll learn more in the next couple of weeks too, if, if some of what I'm talking about is actually true or just false assumptions, but that's kind of reading between the lines what I've seen. Awesome, yeah, no, that's really great perspective. I, I remember one of the things you mentioned was a lot of the assumptions that you had gone into the design with were either flipped or you know completely wrong. Um, what were, do you remember what a few of those were? Or maybe I'm remembering somebody else talking about it, but I think it was somebody from uh, MetaMask. Yeah, I, I may have said something like that. Um, I think it, it really is the assumption that one, people, people will understand, like if, if you give people, if you call something advanced and you give them the advanced controls, you assume they know, like if you represent what's going on behind the scenes accurately, that, that it's okay if they don't understand it because it's advanced, right? And maybe it's not for them. And if they, if they want to use advanced controls, they're going to understand it. It, it, it doesn't seem to be the case. Like People, even even people who have an understanding or like have a high level understanding of 1559, I think the narrative of, you know, base fee and tip and like just the language that has been thrown out, like it just didn't match the two fields that we put in there, right? So it could be as simple as changing the names of them or, you know, making them a little more accessible. Um, so that, I mean, that was one assumption that we were wrong about. Um, the other, I think, was that our range of estimates, like the algorithm shouldn't be as wide. It should be a little bit more conservative and, you know, high, medium, low is all within this like sort of smaller range. Um, and the, like, it just doesn't really make sense, right? Like if you're gonna go low, you should wait a long time and there should be some risk attached to it that your transaction may not go through. And if you go really high, there should be some risk that you're gonna pay a higher tip, but there's lower, you know, but that is gonna go through much quicker. So our assumptions that we didn't need a wider range on our estimate was probably the other one that was wrong. Also, just if I can add to that is like, we did not anticipate the, the crazy surges that uh, are happening so often. Uh, you know, we, we assumed that it would happen, but we didn't assume that it would happen so often during the day. And it happened several times a day. And I think therefore the controls were, as, as Jake said, a little bit more towards the middle, as in like the variations weren't that, that different. Uh, because we're uh, assuming that the users will choose from, from one of those three settings. So I think the learnings here is that these spikes will happen and we have to account for that. And, but at the same time, the majority of the time, you know, users will choose the middle option. Um, but we have to also provide the flexibility in, in cases where you know, users want to you know, be fast or be slow or you know, have, be, be adaptable as much as possible. Um, I just had a question. So uh, when you talk about the sugar coding that you did for the advanced fields, I was curious, like what were the fields that you did expose and like, what did, what did you call them? Or like, how, how did you sugar coat them exactly? So or we so didn't specific, sugarcoat like, them at all. Oh. Um, oh, okay. we, we literally had two fields. There was max priority fee and uh, max fee. And we, we have some tool tips. You can, you know, you can look at them, but it's like, we pretty much just gave you the raw fields. If you were going to use them realistically, you'd have to be, you'd have to have something pulled up another tab. You'd have to be looking at a, you know, a chart of current base fee and stuff to, well, I shouldn't say that they're, they're default populated with our estimates, but you'd have to understand what, what that meant to go off the rails with them. So. Oh, um, I see. Yeah. The, the, the new, so we are going into user testing now and trying to, uh, you know, shift these fields around a little bit from what I have gathered. Um, and I think, which makes sense with just like the narrative around 1559, it's, it's base fee and priority fee, right? Like that's how people, people who understand 1559, yeah. 59 think about, it, cause that's, that's yeah. the mental model. That's how it makes sense. It, 
So the the fields that we're looking at now, if I'm remembering correctly, um, priority fee, we're calling a priority fee, even mm -hmm. though it's technically a max priority fee, we're just not saying that because the idea of a max priority fee was kind of confusing. And I do mm -hmm. think right now we're using max base fee. Um, yeah. Okay. And yeah, not so just that, saying base fee, but that's where yeah. we're um, Yeah. Our designer was just able to um, send us over some designs uh, this week. And so, yeah, that, that matches with what we have right now is is we decided to show the current base fee and then the two fields that we expose are the max base fee and the priority. Um, cool, cool. And, yep. and, um, and I think exposing the current base fee too is a piece of feedback that, and we were going to put in our UI, we just haven't, we didn't have it in there for the first version, but that's been consistent yeah. feedback too. I mean, of course people need a reference point, right? Cool. And um, also may I ask what your, so, for the multiple on the base fee that you're doing on the low, medium, high, are you, um, what was, I think I, Micah said that, oh, no, no. So we're, what we're saying is, um, unfortunately, the way that we're presenting it to our users is not like a max total. So for, for users who aren't like ultra in the EIP 1559 world, um, it doesn't make sense. It, it like gives them more work to do if you make them do the math of like having the total and then subtracting the priority fee versus having the base and adding the priority fee together. That seems to be like the most intuitive way. Um, but tech, so, cause technically it should be max fee, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, but the wording we are using is max base fee for the user to know that this is just the base fee that they're potentially doing a max of is does that make sense i had also the same confusion when i saw no, the designs I, because i was thinking in like a total max um i mean so, so the protocol does not allow you to set a max base fee so there's no way that your ui can be asking user for max base fee because that's impossible um, you might be asking user for something else and then calling a max base fee but like there, there, there's oh. no way you could actually be putting that into a transaction. Right, you're um, setting the max fee, which would be the difference between correct. your, yeah. And yeah. That's, that's that's one thing that has been confusing is like the max fee, like people look at when they see priority fee and max fee, they're like, well, where's the base fee? What, what's my base fee? So you could call the field max fee and then explain around it that, well, actually this is your base fee. You got to subtract your max priority fee. And like, that's kind of what we attempted to do. And I think- So it sounds- We're just kind of trying to get around that a little bit maybe. It sounds like we're in this uncomfortable position where we have a set of users who have heard a little bit about 1559. Um, if they're asking, where's my base fee? That means they like read half an article <laughs> and are now confused. Um, and what I worry about I exactly is, what, happened, yeah. what, I, what I worry about just a little bit is optimizing user experience for these users that have ever heard of base fee. I would prefer, and of course, as each wallet can do what they want. I would prefer to optimize though for users who have never heard of base fees or priority fees or transaction fees or anything, they're brand new to Ethereum and they're like, I don't know, there's a fee here. Um, and I feel like this optimization is kind of special case for the current set of users, not necessarily the future set of users, which maybe at the moment so, is an appropriate uh, optimization. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think you might be misunderstanding the the UI if I'm like you're saying don't optimize for somebody who would be talking about base fee. Is that what you're saying? Like optimize for yeah, like if somebody if is coming in fresh. Base fee, yeah, exactly. They're they're not a fresh user. If they so heard of that's the base fee that's before. totally the case. Like our UI, you have to go three levels deep before we say anything about base fee. We don't talk about base oh, okay. fee. We don't talk about priority fee. We're optimizing for we're optimizing for somebody who knows nothing. But there we are like what we're hearing about is this like twenty percent use case of like advanced users who are confused with the answer setting. So that that's what we're talking about, and I I totally agree. Yeah, it should be. Um, let me just jump right away. Leaky, did you wanna? You've had your hand up for a while. Did you wanna say something? Uh, yeah, I had a question to MetaMask, how you currently uh, handle Trezor, basically, uh, now that the firmware is not yet released, and how you plan to do it in the transition phase, where basically some users have the old firmware and some have the firmware with 1559. Thank you. I think I heard, did you say Trezor? 
Yeah, I said Trezor. So they currently didn't yet release the firmware. So they have a firmware um, with 1559, but it's not yet released. Um, and how do you handle it currently? So do you fall back to the, the old behavior? And how do you plan to handle it in the transition phase where basically some users have the old firmware without 1559 and some have it with 1559? Yeah, currently we don't support 50, uh, Trezor on 1559. So it, it falls back to the, the legacy. Um, but we, we will support uh, uh, Trezor shortly. Uh, we currently just rolled out today uh, support for Ledger. So, uh, you know, all the, you know, supporting uh, hardware wallets are high on our initiative. So we're, we're taking them uh, one, one hardware wallet at a time. And is the Ledger support going to be rolled out progressively or is it just 100%? All out. Uh, I believe it's at ten percent right now, but yeah, it's it's progressively rolled out. Yeah, so we're we're, we're looking into whether or not things are breaking. We're also gathering feedback from from Ledger uh, themselves. We're we're in close partnership with them. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah, one of the things I'm tracking pretty closely is, uh, or is sort of a proxy for how all the user facing interfaces are working. Is if you scroll to the bottom of the link I just sent. Um, legacy versus dynamic fees. We've been hovering around 60-ish percent um, for the past week. Uh, and it's actually decreased in the past few days. So um, if anybody has ideas or providers that they know of which haven't implemented it yet, please let me know and I can um, reach out to them and we can try to get them support because uh, hopefully we get this to 100 sooner rather than later, 100%. Um, so yeah, that was Lee's question about Trezor. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt whatever discussion was happening. We can jump back into that. It's about naming. Cool. Oh yeah. So well, I, I had um, another question uh, for Jake about um, what you guys are using for the multiple on on the base fee, and so I assume for like the priority fee, you might be using the um, the exposed like histogram or, 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 you know, what, whatever the last few, whatever priority fees are, but, uh, what are you guys using for your multiple on the base fee in general, or like, how do you decide how to do that? Is it? Yeah, I, I don't have mm -hmm. a, sorry, go ahead. Uh, you weren't done. Oh yeah. Cause, cause, uh, you know, we've seen a few different places where, you know, the, the, the base fee is like consistently two X and we, from like the data, it doesn't seem like that's necessary. And so um, we're trying to figure out how to be smarter about it so that we're not like over bloating the, the price to our users. Yeah, totally. Uh, sorry for the confusion. I think we want to say, when we say base fee here, we want to say max max fee per gas, right? Max fee, where, where you 2X the, 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 the max priority fee per gas, right? So when you mean, ba when you mean base fee, you mean uh, max, max fee, do you? So uh, I feel like maybe I'm forgetting something, but uh, my understanding was like like two x base fee plus uh, some tip was like the max that people were recommending earlier on. So I just mean like the multiple, like the two mm. times the base fee plus the priority. Like so, ignoring the priority, ignoring um, yeah, so ignoring the priority, just keeping okay. like what is the multiple two x plus? You know that that's what I that's what I'm I referring to. Yeah, there was some initial discussion a few weeks ago about uh, it could possibly be defaulted to 1.2 or 1.3. Two might be right. a little high, um, right. but there's no, I don't think any hard research yet. Uh, it's probably on Barnaby spec burner for now, um, but definitely something to, if anybody knows of uh, a deeper dive into this, I'd love to see it. Yeah, because I, I guess the, like, oh, sorry, go ahead. I think the important question to ask is what uh, what experience do you want for your users, and um, how many of them are you willing to have a bad experience? And that, that's the trade-off, right? So if you set that too low, you will have a larger percentage of your users who will end up with a bad experience if things do not go well for them. Um, and so I think a very important question is to decide what what your cutoff is. Like, do you want ninety eight percent of your users to be happy and two percent to be sad, or do you want you know ninety nine percent to be a little less happy? and 1% to be very sad. 
where a little less happy means they see a bigger number for the fee and sad means their transaction ended up pending for three hours. Yeah, I guess I guess I see having a bigger number for the fee is also a sad category for us as in <laughs> that's like uh, it's it's right. Yeah. And like the, and it the happiest like user I, is sadder. <laughs> yeah, I guess like if you could if and if you could keep the bands right the multiple of this pretty tight and then just uh, manipulate the priority fee kind of competing in the priority fee in that sense, then you kind of opt like you're you're maximizing kind of their you're minimizing the, the bloat that they see and you're maximizing how quickly they can actually successfully get in that time. So I, yeah, I was wondering like, Jake, do you guys have like a hard uh, hard coded number for this? Or I, I, it's, it's like sort of feels like everybody's got a hard, hard coded number for this. And I was wondering if there was any, anything else. Yeah, I, you hit the nail on the head with like every, everybody talking about this. It's like, this is like the hardest part because so... Uh, I, I'm not the best person to speak about the exact numbers. I could probably throw some out, but we've been changing them so frequently, but they're all within the range that everybody said, like 1.2 to two. Um, and the, the problem is it's like the happy, sad user, right? Like if you take, if you take the middle case and you uh, try to make 98% of your users happy or whatever, which is pretty much what our middle case does you're totally not supporting the use case of somebody who wants to save money in a spike, right? Because you're responding to the market right. so quickly that that medium price is relatively high to the past two hours, six hours or whatever. Um, so yeah, that middle one is the tricky one. Like what is the default and like how, and I think we, in order to not disappoint users, we have to be, we have to show a higher max fee, right? so that transactions don't get stuck. And we have to have people opt into a potentially dangerous situation where they have to wait. Um, and I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact numbers, so I can't answer the question, but I, it was around like 1.5 when we first launched. Um, and, and then it's cool. adjusted from there. And did you, um, and so is there a big difference though between low, medium, high on the multiple aspect of it? Or, so I like, think, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Because like, um, you know, Technically, the the longer you wait, the the higher it can go. But then you, right. if you're paying low, you don't want to have this huge, huge range of prices, right? So, uh, you, you'd expect actually to keep it tighter for even the low, just that you don't want them to overpay. And then for the like, if they, they're really urgent, you also want to keep the, you know, there's like these people who want this transaction in now or or never. And in which case, you want to keep the multiple also pretty tight and just bump up the priority fee quite a bit so that you're competing and in getting into ASAP. So uh, so I assume the multiple shouldn't really change. Like, I don't see why you would, uh, I don't see how the multiple should change for like a low, medium, high per se versus like the, yeah. just the priority fee. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think there's definitely some truth there. I think for, it depends on how low your low setting is, right? Like if the low setting is really low, then I mean, the max base fee should be much, much lower than the current base fee, depending on where it is, right? It should be, it should be like a low over a period of time or something. For the high, you're right. Like if it would be like now or never, where you would just slightly overestimate, like do a medium overestimate of the base fee so that you're eligible for the next couple of blocks if you don't get in immediately. And then you crank your priority fee really high up so that it gets accepted immediately. And if it doesn't go through, well then you just gotta wait. And you cancel the transaction. Worst case scenario is like you miss the ride up and then you get hit on the way down when it comes back down to your max base fee. The the other way you would set a high is you would set a super high max base fee and a super high priority fee. And then you're just mm -hmm. saying, no matter what, I want this transaction in, right? So the like high has a couple ways you could play it, like mm -hmm. mod moderate base fee, high tip or high tip, high max base fee. I have a kind of like a follow-up question. Uh, is, is there anyone actually detecting trends? Uh, you know, if, if the, the, there is a, an, uh, a trend, like the, the base fee is trending up and, you know, that will mean that you will have to like uh, potentially uh, choose a, a, a higher multiplier uh, or, you know, a, a lower if, if the trend is going down. Uh, is, is there any wallet doing that? So uh, I'm not, not a wallet dev, but what I've noticed, um, this is anecdotal, uh, Barnaby may have better data. What I've noticed is there tends to be relatively few trends outside of day-to-day -day seasonality. 
um, with the exception of when there's one of these NFT sales, in which case there's no way your user is getting to get in. Like the only users that get in over those like five to 30 minutes that the NFT sales are going on is if they're very professional, you know, bots, stuff like that. Um, and so if you ignore that, because no normal user is going to be able to beat that, um, then I think the trends are just generally general seasonality, you know, like at uh, what, whatever time it is. So at, sorry, uh, at like 8 a.m. UTC daily is the cheap time of the day, you know, and Sundays tend to be cheaper, the cheapest day of the week. So like that seasonality is there, but those are very long term trends. So if you look at a big graph over many over the whole week, you'll see the up and down daily. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of trends just like within an hour, for example, again, ignoring the NFT sale drop thing. Yeah, we've been we've been tracking Dune Analytics as well, and we're trying to make some sense out of the, the spikes that are happening. Uh, is it is it regular? Is it consistent? And there's no consistency to this at all. So it's it's very hard to to create uh, any any type of uh, predictive algorithms based on that. I have a quick question. Have you actually seen? Um a substantial number of transaction that actually has just the base fee without tipping? Because we've been like, I mean, I guess we haven't done much research, but just a kind of basic monitoring um, transactions. We did not see any transactions that have just the base fee. Everything yeah, I, has I, to I, have some kind of priority. Most, I, I think almost all interfaces are gonna put something in there. Um, the question is what the default suggestion is, I think that could definitely use some work, um, whether it's too high. I know uh, one of the issues on the agenda, we can get to that after, but it's um, uh, either a presentation issue or the, I think it's the Web3.js is, if you're using an older version, pre-1559, it's suggesting the wrong, uh, the tip, the wrong priority fee. Um, but I don't think that there are a ton of transactions going in if any, that uh, have zero tip. Um, I personally have sent the lowest I sent, I think was, I think uh, 0 0.01 GUI. It took maybe 15 minutes, so much, much longer than typical, but that's the lowest I've sent. And um, I, I don't think that's gonna be standard for every other user. Uh, I think what people are normally recommending is one to two GUI. Were you asking, are there any UIs that do not prompt the user for a uh, well, priority fee? Or were you asking if there are any transactions that actually get mined on chain without a priority fee? Well, I guess I was asking the latter. Um, the reason I'm asking, because we're working on the UI right now, and the version that we came up with is we actually do not present the base fee at all. Um, we have the three priority versions, like normal, high, and highest, I believe and all of them include the tip in them. Um, so I'm just wondering if this is a um, good assumption to make just because in general, I, yes. I okay. Yeah, the, the network, the gossip network shouldn't actually um, propagate any transactions that have zero priority fee. If they, if they are, that's a bug or a very, very altruistic person. Um, on the network somewhere. Uh, as far as miners, there was some miners initially that had some misconfigured um, deployments of their nodes around London, and they were mining transactions with zero priority fee. I believe they are now all fixed. And so, A, your transaction will not propagate if it's got too low of a mm -hmm. priority fee, yeah. or shouldn't. And B, even if it did, no one will mine it. Um, if, if you're running like your own local miner, then you could mine one with zero priority fee and minor payouts may do this. Um, but as far as user interfaces for end users, um, you definitely need to include a priority fee on everything. And I wouldn't recommend going below one. Like below one, you probably won't propagate and so your transaction will just kind of get lost in the ether. Uh, yeah, sorry, so ether's a bad word there. Lost in the, the space <laughs> between things. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the um, other. The, Go ahead. Uh, on the on the multiplier thing too, I do think it, maybe somebody has a different opinion on this. I'd love to hear it if they do. But it does seem like the correct the correct algorithm would adjust based on network traffic, right? Because like if you can submit a point one way tip and blocks aren't filling up, like 
that should probably be the default for your medium option. Like if, if it's, if we have a strong, if we have a strong belief that there's not going to be a sudden spike, which we can never predict, it could happen. The default should not like have the user overpay, even though, I mean, 0.1 GUI and one GUI is probably not a huge difference. Um, and then that's what the, like a higher option should be for is like saying, Hey, I want to make sure I get in. Like I'm buying insurance against a sudden spike. I'm there's an NFT drop. I'm going into a gas war or something. And that's what that setting should be. So like the medium in a perfect world would be much more flexible to medium, meaning the default value should be much more flexible to what's going on. But that's, and that's something we're exploring, but it is, it is hard. <laughs> As, as an anecdote, um, when I'm personally doing transactions on Ethereum, for most of my stuff, I do one priority fee, just flat, and just say one, no matter what the UI suggests to me, I always put one. If it's something that I really need to go in right away, I will sometimes bump it to like three. Um, the only time I will go up to like beyond that is if I'm doing some sort of highly competitive action, like I'm actually trying to you know, buy an F NFT or whatever. Like something where I, I know there's, because of information I have that's outside of the scope of what a wallet has, like I know about what's going on in the real world. I know there's going to be a burst of activity and I want to participate in that burst. That's the only time I'll go above like, you know, three. Um, again, just anecdotal, my experience, and this seems to work really well. Um, all of my ones go in within a few blocks and my threes basically always go in within one block. I actually just had a quick question. Like, I think I've been using 2.5 for literally everything, and I've never not had anything included in the next, like, block or two. Are we seeing people with, like, like, is there actually any meaningful difference between 2.5 two, between and, like, 8? Are we seeing cases where there's a bunch of things in the transaction pool sitting at 2.5 and not getting mined? I also make transactions at times where the gas price is low, so I've I've... I've I'm also like low, I don't know if that's the right word for it, but lower than, than we're seeing. So maybe that's also part of the, the reason why, but I'm just curious, is there actually any value to having a really high priority fee? So the time you would need a high priority fee is when you have consec multiple consecutive blocks that are, I guess there's two situations. One, if miners are setting the minimum priority fee, they'll mine higher than one. Um, we've been advising miners to set it to one because that is above their opportunity cost. And so, you know, a, a spherical miner will set it to one because that's rational. Um, we don't actually know for sure if the miners are actually doing that. And I don't know if anyone has good data on that, but that'd be great to see if, if possible. Um, so if they're setting it to one or whatever, then in theory, the only time you should not be included in the block is if the block was 100% full. And while we do frequently see 100% full blocks, we very rarely see more than like two blocks in a row that are 100% full. Sometimes you'll get like three, um, but even that's pretty rare. Again, ignoring those NFT drops, which are just like this oddity that you cannot account for. <laughs> um, so you shouldn't see a difference between 2.5 and eight. Like you shouldn't really see much of a difference between one and 2.5 even. Yeah, so it seems to me like the more important thing to actually set is that multiplier rather like that the priority fee should almost just kind of always be hard coded at the whatever value you want to use for uh, uh, uncle risk plus uh, MEV risk, whatever. So is priority fee even the important thing to modify? Like if you're talking about like high, high, medium, low, like it almost depends what you really care about. Like I feel like the, sorry, it's kind of loud over here. Um, sorry, I'm just like, I'm half asleep as well. But I feel, yeah, I feel like the multiplier is the more important thing to set in this case is, oh, actually, I want to bring up one other quick thing. Um, I really like what MetaMask is doing with the kind of every couple seconds, stall the universe, take away the button from me so I can't click on it and like fetch the new, uh, the new price. Because I also think that kind of reduces the problem we're talking about right now, because that means the multiplier that you're using isn't something when the UI first popped up. Like I usually click around for a second, check all the prices, make sure the data looks safe and what's about to do is what I expect it to do. So I really enjoy just kind of like uh, having, cause I feel like that also reduces the risk of what the multiplier needs to be. One quick thing, I would kind of like to see like, you know, three seconds left before we refresh this price and they refresh. Cause what I find myself doing is waiting until I see the price fade away and the button come back in, because then I know it's got the most recent values. Um, 
anyways, I'm kind of all over the map, but I feel like that multiplier is more important than the priority fee. And that's my, my, my thoughts. As per usual, Micah completely disagrees, um, but maybe he can talk if he'd like. I, I do find myself uh, in that position <laughs> as well, where you know I'll, I'll open, uh, I'll start to send a transaction and then go do something else and then come back and it might be a completely different base fee a few minutes later. And yeah, just for clarity on my uh, unhelpful comment there, um, I, do, I do appreciate that MetaMask is re re repeatedly updating the, the base fee. Um, what bugs me is the fact that the whole UI freezes. And so like, there's so many times about to click a button and it just goes out from under me and then I have to wait a second and then I try to click it again, but another block comes really quick and I miss and it drives me nuts. So you don't want the, you don't want the price to, to change as you're clicking the button. That'd be even worse if you like, if you agree to something and like mid click the thing like sweeps out from underneath you and next thing you're like, ah, I like three ethers I, I, or something. I, I see it. I see the difference now. So I completely ignore um, what the actual current base fee is, 100%. I have a fixed price. I'm willing to pay for a transaction that I know I know before I even look at that window, and I'm just setting it. So like, for example, I know I'm willing to pay 100, 100 for this. So I set one, 100, go. Like, that's what I try to do. But you know, I set one, and then the UI locks up, and then I wait for it. And then I set 100, and then the UI locks up, and I wait for it. And then I click go. Um, and so I, I don't actually care what it's doing, um, which I realize now is a difference in like how we're going about, about using the UI, which is why we have different opinions. So, so Micah, do you, so this means like you you don't really care about the bloat because you're the one like deciding like what like this one hundred yeah, as your number and I. I'm a I'm a spherical human. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Uh, unlike so, everybody else, like I, I literally ahead of time I know you know like I care about this transaction enough that I'm willing to pay this much for it to go through, and I know that right. before I know what the current price is, uh, like what the current cost. And sometimes I will put that through, and I will have to wait because the something's happening and I wasn't paying attention. Um, right. And that's okay. what's, like. I expect so that and I'm okay with it. That's just how I operate. So that would be the reason why you don't care about the current base fee being uh, part of the UI. Whereas I think most people yep. would want to know like, hey, I'm in this advanced setting. What does this number mean relative to what the current state of the world is? I assume. And so, yeah, so that's I, interesting. I think a lot of users, um, I mean, this is, this is something you see just in, in retail and everywhere in, in, in terms of pricing. Uh, people often want to pay something that they feel is fair or normal more than they have like some sort of utility function where they're trying right. to figure out, you know, is this actually valuable to me? Like when you go out right. and buy a Louis Vuitton bag, you're, you know, you're not paying how much the bag is worth to you. You're paying how much is the bag worth to society and to everybody around you. And I think humans, that is very common in humans to have that sort of behavior when it comes to pricing things. Um, and I think they apply that here. And so like, I want to know what a normal price or a good price for gas is. Just like, I want to know what a normal price for apples is. And I'm trusting society to have priced that appropriately. And you know, if that's what it costs, that's what it costs. They're not thinking, oh, this is worth this much to me. If it costs more than that, I'm going to go somewhere else or I'm not going to eat an apple or I'm going to buy a different bag. Yep. Let me jump in real quick. There's this thing that Tim had put in the agenda and I wanna make sure we get to it and then we can jump back into discussion. Uh, Greg, if you wanna talk next, but really quick, uh, I don't know if you wrote this before or after we narrowed it down, but Tim had written something about when um, the max priority fee and max fee is auto filled with the same value. And I think, I believe it's related to using an old version of a library, I think Web3.js. Um, Harith, do you I, remember what the- I, I can tell you what the, I can tell you what the problem is. So the, I, sure. I'm pretty sure the problem is, is um, ap applications are sending MetaMask a, a transaction and they're pre-populating for what is, some applications populate the gas price in there. And so they're telling MetaMask, use this gas price. And then MetaMask is saying, hey, you told us to, app told us to use this gas price. So we're going to use this gas price. Um, and with the change to 1559, those applications, you know, they are not updated for 1559. So they're just still doing the old thing. They're maybe using a gas oracle or something. And so MetaMask is doing what the application told us to do, which is set a gas price, even though that behavior is probably not what's actually desired anymore. Yes. Um, yep. That's, so that's what I was getting to. 
Go ahead, Harry. Um, so at least from ETSCAD side, uh, that's actually not true. Uh, we've never suggested a gas price, uh, either before or now. Uh, so we don't know right now whether it's something that MetaMask is doing or the library, uh, what PJS is doing. Uh, but yeah, it, 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 there's two parts. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's giving those uh, two same numbers. And um, at least on MetaMask, there is a UI that says etherscan.io is suggesting this gas price. And yeah, we, yeah, we don't actually know what to do because we've never No, for what, if, for what it's worth, um, I messaged somebody, one of your team members on Twitter, like you guys are using an outdated version of MetaMask, of Web3.js. Like that's 100% yeah. what's causing issues there. So, so um, we have a fix for that already. Uh, the thing with that is that if we push that fix, then uh, as far as we understand the... Um, if we do that, then users who use uh, Ledger, at least until uh, it was launched today, uh, wouldn't be able to use uh, the right contract feature at all, which is an even bigger problem. So we just decided to delay until uh, that uh, Ledger support is uh, rolled out. Okay, that's good to know. Um, but yeah, if anybody comes across this in an application or finds other issues similar to this, just forward it to me um, and I can try and maintain a list and reach out to these teams, unless you wanna do it yourself, but I'm more than happy to take that on. Uh, so just forward me the name of the application or the team that's working on it. And I can see what I can do about that. So I might have missed this at the beginning. Is that a known bug with MetaMask? That if you, if the app doesn't supply a gas price, then MetaMask cannot interface with the ledger? No, I think it's just uh, 1559 support. Yeah, so I, I assumed that MetaMask would just um, downgrade to legacy transaction if it's connected to a ledger. Is it not doing that? My ledger works on MetaMask with type 2 support. I'm like very certain. I mean, so let's say you have a ledger that doesn't support type 2. Will MetaMask do the right thing? and ask for a signature, a type one signature. You're muted, Greg. Oh, they're type zero. I have, no, I have no idea. I, 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 mine are updated to the latest firmware, so. Yeah, okay. As so as what, what? Yeah, sorry. For, for what what either just, just, sorry, go ahead, Andre. Go ahead, okay. Yeah, for my experience at least, uh, well, I was using like MetaMask, I thought I updated it, and I could not like sign uh, type two transactions for a while until I used MetaMask with a ledger, and then I saw that it was actually worked out. So I think that's what somebody said earlier, that uh, ledger didn't uh, support it, or at least the, the combination of two wasn't supported. So then MetaMask was uh, falling back to, to type zero transactions. So I think it's, well, it's the application is, is done properly, right? If the job doesn't support it, then it'd be type zero. And if it does, then it goes to type two. That's my feeling. So I guess what I'm getting at is that Etherscan should be able to update the Web3 library and not have Ledger users break. If that's happening, then something is wrong. Like there's a bug somewhere that someone should be fixing. Like Etherscan not so sending that. Is correct behavior. Okay, if this is definitely the case, then uh, we we can push it like whenever. Uh, it, it was just our understanding that if we did push it, then Ledger users wouldn't be able to uh, to use the features at all. Yeah, I, I don't think that's the case, and the reason I say that is because like we broke Yearn or we broke somebody. I don't know. Bantag blew me up, and like we patched it, and it seemed to it work for like every all of their users. So I'm pretty sure you guys should be safe to update. All right, uh, Greg, maybe we should uh, kind of follow up later. Uh, there's a Telegram group uh, between Etherscan and MetaMask, and it wasn't really responded to. Maybe we, we should have uh, communicated better as well. But yeah, we, we didn't want to make the assumption and, and break user experience. Yeah, 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 no, sure. Let's go async. That sounds good. Uh, so I actually had a quick question because somebody mentioned that they, uh, well, Micah was saying that he just sets the price he wants and lets it fly. Um, so I have not experienced this. Like I said, I've been kind of choosing my times well and that sort of thing. 
and giving good priority fees. But I've seen people complaining that they're setting a base fee and they get this error that says um, transaction, oh, maybe it's a gas price. It says transaction gas price is too low for the next block, which has a base fee per gas of XXX. So is there, how does the transaction pool, memory pool, yeah, make sure, like you can't just set some low base fee that I want, this is how much I'm willing to pay and send it out to the network because if it's too low, it seems like the memory pool just won't adopt it, right? Which it kind of has to do for a DDoS permit mitigation. Um, am Correct. I just saying that or? Well, so uh, there's a few nuances here. Um, if you are using your own node, your own node will always accept your transactions, no matter how low they are, and they'll hold on to them until they can gossip them. And so if you're connected to an own node, then this just works, um, which I admit I have my own node. And so this works for me great. I send it, basically I send my transaction to my node. My node just hangs on to it and will eventually gossip it. Um, providers like Infura and Alchemy, I, I can't speak to exactly what they do, but a reasonable strategy would be that if you're a paying subscriber, they would do that behavior. And if you're a free subscriber, they would say, hey, too low, we're not gonna hang on to your stuff for you for free. Um, I, again, I, I don't know what they actually do, um, but that probably influences the behavior you get. And that being said, there is like, as long as you're higher than the lowest person in the mempool right now, you'll get gossiped. And so you don't have to be, um, you shouldn't have to be above the current base fee. You should just have to beat whoever the lowest in the mempool is, the global mempool. Do you still have to beat, do you still have to beat the current base fee? You, you should not. Like you just have to beat the, you just have to be high enough that um, someone else gets kicked out of the mempool, not you. But wouldn't that be easy so you should. to force just by publishing a whole lot of transactions? Because I mean, it's, it's pretty safe to broadcast a transaction whose base fee is less than, or let's say one, let's say equal to one half the current base fee. Because you can do that relatively assured you're not gonna get mine anytime soon. And that means you can kind of evict people, doesn't it? So, so yes, you can evict people who lowball, um, but you will eventually have to pay that or more. It's so like eventually, like your nonce is now sitting in the penny pool and will stay there until someone else evicts you or until you pay something. So your, your account basically is locked up and that account has to have ETH in it. And so you are locking up that ETH um, until such time as you spend that ETH on a base fee sometime in the future. And so it's not a free attack. Like you do have to spend money to do this. And um, there's some, some new, again, some nuance there. If you plan on doing a transaction, like in three days, you can say, okay, I can use this account to like this one account to consume one spot in the mempool for three days, knowing that in three days, I'm just going to bump the gas price and it'll go through and it'll be fine. So there's a little nuance there, but again, it's, it's a, a expensive enough attack that we don't have to worry about that particular vector from a DDoS standpoint. Okay. I would add that that attack is a little bit limited because um, the the nodes will separate the underwater transactions, underwater on base fee from those that are marketable. And so it's not like you could consume the entire mempool with these underwater transactions. Well, that's kind of my concern, right? It's like somebody who's using underwater transactions, not because they're trying to attack the system, but because they just, they want a cheap fee and they're willing to wait. And so like, I feel like there's like the two different things are kind of at, at odds with each other because if I'm willing to wait three days and I, I put some low fee in there, I don't want to be evicted because someone else kind of has another one that they're like, assuming all legitimate users, I feel like a legitimate user could lose out having a lower base feed uh, transaction. Yeah, you, you definitely can, which is why if you're going to do this sort of lowballing, you should have a node that's willing to prioritize your transactions in its own local mempool, um, such as your own node. Or again, I, I don't know if Infura or Alchemy or these providers do this, but hypothetically, um, if you're a paid subscriber to those services, it would be reasonable for them to um, keep them, consider your transactions local. Is there, is there a general rule in how long a transaction can sit in the mempool and what are the conditions based on which it gets kicked out? Uh, so the, the only rule is that each um, client on the network, each node on the network sets has a mempool size. So they have like a certain number of transactions um, or bytes depending on the client that they're willing to hold. And then um, if 
that fills up, which it usually does eventually, then the lowest one gets kicked out basically. So it's just a simple, the top end users get to stay, everybody else gets kicked out. Again, with the caveat there that your local node, so it, if your node considers the transaction to be local, meaning it was sent directly via JSON RPC to that node, not received via gossip over the network, and it considers that a local transaction, it will prioritize those and never evict them. I would like to I add to unless, that, that uh, there, you... there are infrastructure providers such as ourselves at Block Native that also run uh, several nodes with extremely large mempool, basically infinitely sized mempools in order to ensure rebroadcast of lower feed items so that a typical mempool, which might be, let's say 4K slots, um, you know, it, it, it will rebroadcast those to uh, when the prices come down to those lower fee ones. And I think other infrastructure providers might be doing themselves. Um, if, for example, they're measuring the total size of the mempool, which is typically around 150,000 or more uh, entries, then you, you kind of have to, you, you would typically be running a few nodes with extremely large mempools to do that. Is it? Are you guys willing to share what exactly how big your mempools are? I'm curious. How big we allocate or what the size of it is yeah. at any given moment. Um, I guess um, we, we, we run actually, those are they not full? I'm sorry? Are, are they not full? I assume they'd always eventually fill up. They do not. Interesting. Okay. We, we, we okay. run nodes that can support up to 1 million transactions and they are definitely not full. Oh, okay, uh, so there you have it. So that so ignore everything I said. Uh, the global mempool um, is apparently run by Block Native, <laughs> and they will hold on to transactions forever. <laughs> I, I wouldn't quite characterize it that way, but I, I think that you can you can <laughs> you can have very large mempools to measure how big the mempool is, and uh, those can then sort of rebroadcast. Um, another another item there is that in, for example, get the um you can there's a setting that will tell how long it'll hold on to a transaction if it does not hear a rebroadcast of it um to, and i think the default for that is three hours so if you don't hear any gossip on the transaction for three hours and you're not seeing any activity on that transaction uh, then you might get rid of it good context there thanks thanks for that discussion uh, we're just about three minutes from the end, so um, we just do a quick wrap up. Um, I think this was pretty productive. Uh, again, this was recorded, so we'll have this if anybody wants to send it on to their team members. Uh, I think we'll upload it to the Cat Herders YouTube, but uh, there'll be a link somewhere. Uh, but if you can't find it, reach out to me in a few days or later today, and it'll be uploaded. Um, just generally, I want to say thanks to everybody who's you know, putting in effort um, there are some parts of the ecosystem which are, you know, leaning into this and really trying to make it work for the users. And there are some who are sort of sitting back uh, and just completely not engaging. And I'm really excited. The fact that people are on this call is that you're engaging with um, the Ethereum ecosystem as it changes, as it evolves. Uh, so thank you from me personally. Um, I think 1559 is it's going to take time, but uh, it'll it'll be an improvement. Uh, I think it already has been an improvement. Um, it's just going to take user education, you know, tweaking, tuning uh, things as they come up. So again, thank you for all of all of the work you guys have all put in. So it's really great. Um, I think we covered all of the issues, and if anything else comes up, I know last time we we automatically set uh, the next meeting. I don't know if we need to do that right now. Um, I think what would probably be most fruitful is when we have more data. And I know Barnaby has been a little busy. Um, not that we're expecting him to do all of our data analysis, but he's definitely got the, the chops for it. So maybe when he has more time and can put together some analysis of um, what the best tip is, some analysis on how quickly the base view moves, uh, we might schedule another call unless people feel you know, in a few weeks, there's there's time for another deeper discussion. I'm totally open to doing that as well, but I don't wanna just make the assumption that everybody wants to have this call uh, every few weeks. Um, 
but yeah, uh, any closing thoughts from folks? Please join the Ethereum R&D Discord, uh, pound fee market, if you want to discuss any of these topics async. Um, there's lots of people there happy to discuss any questions. Um, no need to wait for a meeting if you don't want. Even better. Yeah, I just dropped the link in the, the chat here. And if you don't get it uh, before this ends, just DM me somewhere and I'll, I'll send it to you. But yeah, a lot of great discussion happens async there. Uh, and by discussion, I mean people trying to understand what 1559 is and slowly learning what it can do and what it can't do. But um, it's definitely a great place to have discussions. Um, if there are no other final comments, we can wrap there. I'll wait a few seconds for anybody to speak up. And that's a wrap. Thank you again, everybody. And uh, we will reach out if there's going to be another call. Um, and maybe we'll see you in the Discord. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.